Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Invasive Species Center webinar series. My name is Lauren Bell. I'm the Education and Community Outreach Coordinator at the Invasive Species Center, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. The Invasive Species Center is a not-for-profit organization that connects knowledge, stakeholders, and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. So we're located in Sault Ste. Marie, and this is our team. To learn more about the Invasive Species Center's programs and our resources that are available, you can visit our newly updated website at invasivespeciescenter.ca. If you click on the Get News under the Get Involved tab, you can sign up for our mailing list and stay up to date on upcoming events and webinars, as well as, re as register to receive our newsletter and our biweekly media scans. Today is the fifth webinar in our 2020 series that will be featuring a new speaker and a new topic each month. So if you're interested in checking out some of our past webinars in this series or our other program webinars, you can check out our Invasive Species Center YouTube page. This webinar is being recorded and it will be available on our YouTube page uh, once we've concluded. The next webinar in this series is titled Ontario Invasive Species Enforcement Update with speaker Brenda Koning. And this is happening on September 15th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. You can register for this webinar by going to invasivespeciescenter.ca. So before I pass it over to our speakers, I just wanted to go over some logistics for today's webinar. We hope to have some time at the end for questions. All attendees are currently in listen-only mode, so if you do have a question, please just put it into the question box found on the side of your screen throughout the presentation. We do have a lot of listeners on the webinar today, so if your question's not answered, uh, still enter it into the chat box and we can reach out following the webinar. Or you can also send your questions to info at invasivespeciescenter.ca, and I'll be putting this information into the chat box as well. Today's webinar is titled Forests Under Attack, The Management, Dispersal, and History of Gypsy Moth in Canada with our speakers David Dukevich and Taylor Scar. David is the entomology technician at the Invasive Species Center and has worked at the Great Lakes Forestry Center for 11 years in the field of insect diagnostics. David earned his master's in environmental science at the University of Guelph studying forest disturbances caused by emerald ash borer. Our second speaker, Taylor Scar, is Taylor Scar. Taylor is the Director of Integrated Pest Management Division with Natural Resources Canada, Canadian Forest Service, and he's located at the Great Lakes Forestry Center here in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, where he oversees a team conducting research in insect ecology, genomics, taxonomy, population dynamics, detection and monitoring, management, and insect rearing. Taylor holds a PhD in forest entomology and a Bachelor of Science in Forestry, both from the University of Toronto. He has authored or co-authored over 45 scientific publications, plus innumerable reports, presentations, and workshops. I'd like to welcome both of our speakers, and I'm now going to pass it over to David. Uh, thank you very much, Lauren. Okay, so we'll get started. So just a brief discussion on what we're going to be talking about today. Um, we're going to discuss a brief history of the gypsy moth and how it actually ended up in Ontario. Um, a distribution of gypsy moth throughout Ontario. We're going to also touch on the identification. And then Taylor is going to talk about the biocontrol agents and the management of gypsy moth. So to begin, uh, gypsy moth was first introduced by a French scientist, uh, Mr. Trouvelot, uh, who was uh, who lived in Meaford, Massachusetts. Uh, the purpose for his introduction was to try and crossbreed both gypsy moth with the North American silkworm. What he wanted to do was to bring gypsy moth, which um, was a very prevalent eater. It had a wide variety of hosts and could be um, easily fed, whereas silkworms, uh, they tend to only eat from specific trees, and uh, that's the purpose of his uh, why he introduced them. However, gypsy moth is uh, 
a member of the owlet and tussock moth family. And North American silkworm is part of the silkworm and gypsy moth family. So this actually doesn't make a cross. You cannot crossbreed these two uh, types of caterpillars because they will not uh, produce val uh, uh, embryos. Um, so what ended up happening is they were accidentally introduced into the wild um, and they started breeding in the wild. So gypsy moth began breeding in the wild in 1886 and was first recorded as an outbreak in 1980 or in 1889. And this prompted the state to, uh, to put forth an eradication program. 30 cities were affected by this uh, infestation and the state eradication program was started because of those cities. In 1912, uh, the, it became a federal um, matter because of the infestation had come out of Massachusetts and um, they had to produce a quarantine around Rhode Island, New Hampshire, as well as Vermont and Connecticut, and it spread from there. In 1923, uh, the creation of a barrier zone was created, which was uh, from, or from Canada to Long Island. And this was treated with insecticides in order to stop the Western spread of this uh, invasive species. Uh, this was program was terminated in 1941 because of the they were able to find uh, reproducing uh, gypsy moth within the barrier zone. So they ended that um, that program. In 1951, uh, six uh, 600,000 hectares was defoliated, and this is when DDT was actually uh, introduced and started spraying. In 1958, they actually knocked back the population to about 50 hectares of defoliated area. So DDT worked really well. Unfortunately, due to environmental concerns, you know, um, DDT was discontinued because it, it's not a very good uh, spray because um, it harms raptors, bird populations, and it is really bad for the environment. Uh, now getting into a little bit of how it came into Ontario. It was first detected in Ontario in 1969, and it, it had spread uh, throughout the southern Ontario region. And in 1981, in the Kentville district, it was uh, first recorded as a severe defoliation. And from that uh, first recording of a severe defoliation, it became into outbreaks of gypsy moth in 1985, 1991, 2002, as well as 2008. As you can see, these peaks are the outbreaks of gypsy moth. Uh, currently, this is the regulated area uh, that the CFIA has regulated uh, for gypsy moth in Ontario. Um, it spans from Sault Ste. Marie all the way out to uh, Sault Ste. Marie in Ontario, all the way out to uh, Nova Scotia and PEI, uh, Quebec, as well as New Brunswick. Uh, this is a map of uh, Bur Oaks Range. So as you can see, throughout Southern Ontario, the gypsy moth has pretty much uh, got to all the areas of Burr Oak. However, in Western Ontario, there's still, uh, where gypsy moth is not present, uh, there's still areas where gypsy moth uh, can potentially expand to. Uh, so that's why the CFIA, as well as other organizations are trying to prevent the spread of gypsy moth further. Um, a little bit more about the distribution in Ontario. In 2009, this was the uh, distribution, or 2019, sorry, this was the distribution uh, in Ontario with 43,000 hectares of defoliated area in southern Ontario, with the main corridor being from Niagara to about the Grain Banks area. 
in 2020, uh, the MNRF was able to do their flying and mapping. So uh, those results are being uh, put into the computer right now, and we'll be able to have these models for uh, the 2020, hopefully in the 2020 forest report. Uh, this is just a really good photo that one of our staff members took from the Invasive Species Centre along the Grand, Grand Banks Highway Corridor. Um, if you can see in July 2020, almost 100% defoliation of oak trees and other types of trees. And thankfully, uh, after the caterpillars have gone in August of 2020, uh, the leaves are starting to flush back out. Uh, the trees are starting to rebound from this uh, a massive attack in the Grand Banks area. I thought I'd add this in because it's a really good uh, mapping system, this early detection and distribution mapping system. Uh, it comes as an app on your phone and it shows a really good uh, live update of gypsy moth locations in Ontario. Uh, as you can see, there's 377 reports of gypsy moth in Ontario over the last couple of years. And it gives you records of photos, uh, the identification records, the site descriptions, as well as the local uh, location information. And you can see throughout Ontario, you know, gypsy moth is not in one area. It's pretty spread out throughout southern Ontario. So we're not alone in the fact that we're all dealing with the gypsy moth problem, as many ever, as many people attending right now probably know. Um, you can find this uh, mapping system at the edmaps.org slash Ontario website. It's a really good way in order to um, really look at uh, what kinds of populations, what people are seeing, whether they're seeing caterpillars, whether they're seeing pupa or adults. Um, and so that's why I like to look at this uh, website uh, for um, interest sake. Um, a little bit about the identification of gypsy moth. So uh, I took this graphic actually from the um, City of London website on gypsy moth. They actually do a really good job of um, uh, describing the life cycles, but uh, I just wanted to talk about the life cycle as the eggs, you, egg masses, you'll start to see actually around now, the females and males will start to lay those egg masses and they'll overwinter, they'll spend autumn and winter on the trees, uh, on sides of buildings, on those kinds of things, and they'll uh, be present until the spring. Uh, this is a good time to go out and destroy them if you, if you find them and so on. Uh, Moving on to the larva, uh, the larva stage is the most destructive stage. This is when the trees are defoliated. This is when uh, the larva are going out and, and really wreaking havoc and defoliating trees. Uh, this happens from about uh, late April, early May, depending on where you live in Ontario, and it goes until about mid-June. After that, the pupal stage starts to uh, take hold. Uh, the pupa is only a pupa for about uh, 10 to 20 days, depending on where you are in Ontario, and morphs into the adult, as everyone hopefully can remember from their elementary school uh, entomology, if you ever took that. Um, the adult's uh, only purpose in life is to mate. So the larvae are the destructive uh, and defoliating side and the adults, their only purpose is to mate. So they don't actually feed, they don't do anything. They just mate and lay eggs and propagate that new generation. Uh, just to look at the identification of gypsy moth again, uh, these are two different types of egg masses. Uh, one is a fresh egg mass on the right hand side. Uh, as you can see, it's a nice golden color. They're pretty easy to see on the side of trees uh, if you're looking for them. Uh, they have a fuzzy appearance, which is a waterproof uh, fuzz over them. The eggs are quite small and they are very hard and they kind of make a popping sound if you actually do squeeze them with your hand. 
and the egg masses are around two to three centimeters in width with about four centimeters in length. Uh, the overwintering egg masses, they tend on the left hand side, on the left picture here, uh, they tend to have a more like creamy white color, they look a more blue like texture and they're the similar sizes as the fresh egg masses, it's just they are um, a little bit different in appearance. Uh, to talk a little bit more about the identification, the early instar stages of gypsy moth really catch people off guard because they don't look like the older larva. Um, they tend to swarm a lot, sort of crawl in a big group, and they're very small. They don't have very many uh, distinct colors. They tend to be brown or black in color. They do have a lot of hair. But one really distinctive feature is these glands, these two glands on the abdominal segment seven and abdominal segment eight. You can always find those two glands along all the instars of this moth. Um, once they get a little bit older, they actually become more distinct. So once uh, you can, the instar number three, uh, this is about, uh, several days after emerging, um, they have larger clumps of hair. You can start to see the hairs really distinctly. Uh, they have very uh, lots of striping down the side, and these orange dots along their abdominal segments. You can actually really see those really well. And now, once they become older, more mature, uh, at, um, not adult, sorry, uh, more mature larva. They have this um, really distinctive bright uh, blue and red dots along the sides, or along the dorsal side of the caterpillar. Uh, they're very hairy. This hair can be irritating to the skin, uh, whether it's handled the first time or whether it's handled multiple times. That's why it's always a good idea to wear gloves when uh, looking at these, uh, when handling these caterpillars. Their head tends to be a mottled color, so it's black and cream. Uh, modeling and as well as um, they tend to have this black and white striping or modeling along the sides. Uh, the pupae tends to be very dark, sort of a monotone color, dark brownish color with white to yellow hairs that are present along the side. I always tend to think have a really bad hair day while they're sleeping. Um, so uh, you can easily find them. They tend to shelter themselves in areas of like bark cracks and crevices and things like that and, and clumps of leaves, but they also like to hide in human structures like shed overhangs, uh, eavesdrops, um, and around door molding and things like that. Um, on a side note, uh, when I was, uh, I live in the country and so I'm able to go out and uh, I have lots of oaks in the area and I'm able to find uh, the gypsy moth around my place and I find that the best way to get rid of them is I just feed them to my chickens and they have a field day. Uh, they actually really enjoy them so that's how I tend to get rid of them but that's just a side note. Uh, to talk about the females just a little bit. Uh, the females are flightless. Uh, their only job is to reproduce. Um, this is a pretty old female, so you can actually see kind of where the eggs are. You can see almost like individual eggs. Uh, that's a museum specimen, so that's why you can go sort of see a little bit through it. But uh, their only purpose is to lay eggs. They tend to be a creamy uh, white color. They're easily spotted on trees because of this whiteness and they tend to have very faint coloring and this actual colors that they do have is tends to be along the edges of the, the wings. So they have these black spotting along the edges as well as these small arches uh, that are, um, there's about three to four rows of them throughout the wing. Um, and here's a great picture of a, a group of females laying eggs on, on a, a tree. 
Uh, the males tend to uh, be a little bit darker in color, uh, more of a brown tan color. Uh, males can fly quite great distances in order to find females, and um, they can uh, go quite uh, quite the distance to find females. Uh, their four wings are have a wave-like pattern, as well as uh, these dark arches that are found. Uh, they're pretty distinct. If you can see them on this photo as well, these little dark arches there. These are the males here, and that's a, a female in the background. Uh, males will tend to have really frilly antenna um, to detect any pheromones that the females will give off. So that is uh, how to identify gypsy moths. Uh, just a little bit more information about me if you'd like to contact me. Uh, this is my email address and I'm going to send it over to Taylor now. Okay, so I think I'm up and ready to go. Oh, I just need the arrow here. Okay. Thanks, David, and thanks for that background on the uh, biology and um, ecology of this insect. So I'm going to switch into the, um, the actual management aspects of the insect and tie in some of the stuff that David has talked about, about the uh, the biology of the insect and and what it means for uh, for managing this, this uh, invasive species. So it's all about how to get to know this insect and uh, all, taking that biology and, and finding out uh, how best to, to manage for it. Uh, David showed this graph, but I want to repeat this by by indicating that um, you know we are in an increasing population. It appears this year, and we're waiting for the maps coming from the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry. Um, but uh, we're not at the same level that we were probably in the, in the original invasion waves of 1980, uh, 1980s and early 1990s. So those were two invasion waves where those peaks were in 200 and some thousand and over 300,000 hectares of defoliation. So this is now sort of an equilibrium where populations rise and then collapse, rise and collapse, uh, almost always going to be at a lower level than the original invasion waves of the early uh, 19 of the mid 1980s and early 1990s. So put that in perspective, this is 2015 uh, showing, you know, just over uh, 750 hectares of severe to moderate to severe to defoliation in southern Ontario. Um, and the same thing. In, uh, in 2014, where it was concentrated near Sudbury and a little bit near Perry Sound. So uh, this insect is across the range of oak, as David described, in Ontario, except for the far northwest between uh, Thunder Bay and the Manitoba border. But it has distributed itself throughout the range of oak elsewhere, which is its primary host. Uh, perspective on the US, you'll hear a lot in the US about the um, Slow the Spread program. So that is the leading edge program that is designed to, uh, as it says, slow the spread of the insect into new areas. Because whenever you get this insect, there are quarantines imposed by regulatory bodies to restrict the movement. We, we in Canada don't have a slow the spread program, probably because for the most part, the insect is already distributed in the um, range of oak, its primary host. The area in the, um, in the, in the pale brown is, or orange is the, um, quarantine zone in Canada that the Canadian Food Inspection Agency has to restrict the movement of this insect from people moving infested material. But it isn't an active spray program like they have in the US where they do intensive population monitoring and they treat the leading edge with a bacterial insecticide, BTK. They do pheromone releases and, um, and, and they have been effective at slowing the spread of that insect into new areas. So it is a, a, a good example of a slow spread program, but the si same situation does not apply in Canada. So what triggers these outbreaks, these problems that we're having? Well, I mentioned that oak is the preferred species. So you need to have lots of oak uh, or other some other hardwoods like maples, except for red maple. It doesn't feed on red maple, um, but aspen and birch are other, other common hosts. It does well on white pine, and I've seen outbreaks in Toronto on blue spruce, and it also seen it in North of Perry Sound, Magnetowa area on jack pine. So it does feed on some conifers as well. Uh, during its lifetime, that one larva can eat about a square meter of foliage. So 
that can rapidly cause defoliation of, of uh, whole stands of, of hardwoods. Seems to be a bit of a delay here, so we'll just get. So we need abundant hosts, uh, hot, dry spring weather and uh, uh, or summer weather. The insects do better when it's hot. When it's dry, uh, they grow faster and they can outgrow the tree uh, that's trying to produce the foliage. Um, if you get warm winters and deep snow, you also so get better winter survival of the egg masses that David talked about. Uh, if the trees are stressed, say from drought or other insect defoliation, they may not be able to mount the defenses against feeding. So stressed trees can also um, contribute to outbreaks. Um, and interesting enough, if you have a period of low defoliation and low abundance, that what happens is the hosts lose their, their they're not primed anymore for defoliation. Uh, their defenses are not primed. Uh, the predator populations can go down, the parasite populations can go down, and the disease abundance can go down. So if you have a period of, of low defoliation and low abundance of those natural controls, uh, something then triggers that insect to be able to escape those natural controls and take off and go into outbreak. We don't really know what that trigger actually is. We know in this list of things, this is what is necessary for the outbreaks to occur. But we don't actually know what the trigger is that said that says this year in particular, for example, is going to be the the year that it goes into outbreak. But it's probably several of these things working together that allow the the uh, gypsy moth to uh, escape its natural controls and go into an outbreak. One of the other things that drives outbreaks, I mentioned the, the prevalence of, of diseases. So there's a fungus introduced from from Japan. There is no common name for it. So the Latin name is what everybody uses, Entomophaga mimega. Most people just call it Entomophaga, which means uh, insect, insect eating fungus. Um, and this, this uh, fungus was introduced to North America. It uh, causes widespread mortality. The caterpillars die, they get brittle, uh, they drop to the ground and then the spores of the fungus overwinter in the soil. And, um, and then that means that those spores are available for the next time that the weather is appropriate for this fungus. This fungus does particularly well in cool, uh, wet spring or summer weather, and uh, it proliferates and causes the uh, large uh, die-offs of gypsy moth caterpillars. Uh, this is a bit of interesting history here, interesting for me anyhow, was in that um, the entomophaga release was originally around 1910 in, in North America. By, by US authorities trying to introduce this biocontrol agent. Um, nobody saw much of it after that. It didn't seem to be prevalent. And then in the late 1980s, early 90s, um, Cornell University and others started to do some releases of Entomophaga again. And they went out and found the disease was not necessarily where they'd done the releases, but elsewhere. And nobody knows how it got there, if it was actually from the releases or from the 1910 release, or if it came later, um, but it did become prevalent in the late 80s, early 90s. And it coincided with this uh, 1991 eruption of Mount Pinatubo in the Philippines, which is something like the second largest volcanic eruption of the 20th century. And it resulted in at least two years of cool, wet summer weather. And the fungus just did very well and was able to spread across much of the native range, much of the new range of gypsy moth in North America. Uh, and also scientists, uh, including uh, ones at Canadian Forest Service, would take soil from those areas where the fungus was and move it to new areas, the spores would come out and affect the, um, the caterpillars. There's also a virus that attacks gypsy moth. It's specific to gypsy moth um, and it kills the, kills the caterpillars. And you can see on these slides um, where the virus is leaking out of the dead caterpillars because it liquefies the, the internal organs and muscles of the, um, of the caterpillars, then it leaks out other caterpillars crawl across, get that fung get that virus on them, and they become sick and die. Um, you, when you see this inverted V, that's usually a sign that the caterpillar has been killed by the virus. So what causes collapses? Um, cold temperatures. The insect eggs are cold tolerant to about minus 20, maybe minus 25. So if the temperatures get below that, then you can get significant uh, egg mass mortality. Uh, starvation and competition. When you have large outbreaks, uh, then the, some of the insects can't get enough nutrition and they will uh, die from starvation. They can also die from competition. The uh, photo in the center there 
shows the comparative size between forest and caterpillar, a native insect, and the gypsy moth in the middle. And um, the gypsy moth comes out about two weeks later than the forest tent caterpillar. So if the forest tent caterpillar is occurring in the same area in the same year, it's first at the table and it can defoliate the trees before the gypsy moth caterpillars can, can eat them. Um, now, if the defoliation from the tent caterpillar happens the year before or the year after, then those combined defoliations can really stress the trees out. Host trees defenses. So the host trees respond to defoliation. Uh, they'll put out uh, leaves that year or the next year that are tougher, higher in fiber, higher in tannins, uh, less nitrogen, less nutritious leaves. So the, the food becomes less nutritious. Um, and then there's predation and parasitism. Uh, the top right slide shows egg parasites. So think about how tiny those eggs are. And then there are these tiny, tiny wasps called Oncertus that are able to parasitize the um, the gypsy moth eggs, and uh, that can help bring down the populations. The middle slide is of a beetle called the Calosoma beetle, which is an introduced ground predator that feeds almost exclusively on gypsy moth and can uh, cause significant mortality. And then bottom right, there are various parasites, either introduced or native, that will also attack um, gypsy moth. I mentioned the virus, the nucleopolyhedrosis virus, or NPV, and it's labeled here as a density-dependent mortality. And what that means is is the more caterpillars you have, the higher the virus population will be. So it's like a predator-prey relationship. The more caterpillars you get, the more virus you get, the more virus you get, then they spread and eventually kills off the, the gypsy moth caterpillars in very large numbers. So it kind of tracks the gypsy moth population and depends on uh, higher numbers of gypsy moth, more, more virus. So after one to two years of severe defoliation, the virus eventually catches up to the gypsy moth population and helps to kill it off. The fungus, on the other hand, is density independent. So it's more weather dependent. You need to cool wet weather. The, virus, the, the fungus is already out there. It's in the, in, as a spore in the soil. You get cool wet weather. Um, the fungus then spreads and, and attacks and kills the caterpillars. So it, has a, it does respond a little bit. You know, The more caterpillars, the more fungus you're going to have. But it is uh, considered a density independent mortality that really depends on weather. So that's an important factor when you're trying to decide whether or not you want to do anything because if you're relying on the fungus, um, then it's, it's a matter of whether you're going to get the right weather for the fungus to do its thing. Impacts, what does this insect do? Well, here's some aerial shots of what we're all seeing. Uh, these are sh shots from the United States, but they are common what we would see here. Uh, you know, defoliation in midsummer, hillsides, um, one of the things that happens is those tiny caterpillars that David mentioned, when they come out in early instars, they are covered in those fine hairs and they, they can blow on the wind. Um, and that's one way this insect disperses naturally is, and they often end up being deposited on hilltops, which is often where oak likes to grow. So you get a lot of your damage is often most severe on the hilltops because those tiny early instar caterpillars end up there. So an outbreak typically only lasts about two to three years in any given area. So um, if you're getting defoliated this year for the first time, then you might have two to three years of severe defoliation, and then the outbreak typically collapses. We've had a few exceptions around Sudbury and around Perry Sound where the outbreaks have lasted a lot longer, but it's rare to find that the insect has caused severe defoliation for more than three years. As I mentioned in Toronto, I did see it on, on Blue Spruce where it lasted several years longer than three uh, causing an outbreak in, in Toronto on those blue spruce. So there are exceptions, but for the most part, it's three years or less because those mortality factors like the parasites, predators, and the virus will, uh, will knock the populations down. And if you get the right weather, so will the fungus. Most hardwoods can tolerate three years of foliation. They will put out another flush of leaves if they lose more than 50% of their, of their leaves. Um, and they have starch reserves in the trunk and in their roots to, to regrow if they, uh, if they lose their leaves to, uh, to gypsy moth. Uh, so yeah, so they re they'll normally reflush if they get more than 50% defoliation. But that is a stress on the tree. It does use up their starch reserves and if that happens continually, then the trees can go into decline or, or die. Pine trees on the other hand, they store most of their starch in their needles. So if they get 100% defoliated, 
unless the buds are healthy and, and vigorous, then there's a good chance that that pine tree is not going to recover the next year if it's lost 100% of its needles. So pine trees are particularly vulnerable to this insect, uh, especially if they're growing in, in the conjunction with, with oak or maples. Drought, other insects can increase tree mortality. So normally gypsy moth on its own isn't a major tree mortality factor. But if you get another stress, another insect or drought, then you can get mortality um, from, from the uh, gypsy moth outbreak in combination with some other stress. And then over the long term, you'll see changes in forest composition because the oak trees are suffering. We see that a lot on hilltops where you get severe defoliation and eventually the, the trees die out and might get replaced, say, by, by red maple. Or in contiguous forest, over time, the trees get repeatedly stressed and uh, over decades, you get a change in forest composition. Um, this is a slide showing that gypsy moth is part of, uh, you know, an intricate food web, and it has interesting um, complications, I'll call it, from, from how they interact. So on the left panel is mast failure, which is mast referring to the acorn crop. When you don't get a good acorn crop, and sometimes gypsy moth defoliation can result in a poor acorn crop, if you don't get a good acorn crop, then you have fewer white-footed mice that feed on the acorns, you have fewer deer and you also end up with fewer ticks because ticks need both the mice and the deer, the ticks that carry Lyme disease, they need uh, those animals in high numbers to, for the ticks to do well and, and spread Lyme disease. So I, interesting enough, when you get fewer acorns, you get fewer mice, fewer deer, fewer ticks, and the gypsy moth can result in fewer acorn crops. If you have fewer mice though, you can also get more gypsy moth, uh, which can, um, um, increase the defoliation the following year. On the panel on the right, uh, it's the opposite where you have a high mass crop. If you have lots of acorns, then you get increase in mice populations and uh, the mice like to feed on the gypsy moth, particularly on the pupae. And so you can actually have the mice reducing the gypsy moth population, but you also get more deer because you have more acorns and you get more ticks because you have both more white-footed mice and deer, and then you get an increase in Lyme disease. So it's um, showing the intricate food web and how this insect is not, you can't view it alone in the, in the ecosystem. It does have interactions with other parts of the ecosystem. So what's the forecast for 2021? Well, as hindsight is 2020, so we don't really know what it's going to do for sure for next year. Um, we, we know it's cold tolerance to minus 20. We don't know what the weather is going to be, but we, we do know that if the eggs are below the snow line, they have a high probability of survival. We don't know how much snow there's going to be. Uh, and, the egg, and gypsy moth tends to lay, lay about half its eggs below the snow line. Um, we don't know, as it says here, the 2020, to, the winter of 2020, 2021, uh, we don't know what the weather is going to be. Um, also populations increase in hot, dry summers. We've had a good dry summer for gypsy moth. Um, we don't know what it's going to be next spring. If it's cool or wet, then entomophic could, could take off and, and knock the population back down, but we don't know that. One thing that we can do is do egg mass counts uh, in the, in, typically in the leaf off condition to actually count the number of eggs that are uh, present per hectare in a woodlot, if that's per, what someone is concerned about. This uh, detection or this uh, forecasting method was developed by the Canadian Forest Service back in the 1980s. It's called a modified calendar plot, which doesn't really mean anything except it was developed in the calendar area where the gypsy moth first caused severe defoliation. Um, there are other monitoring systems in the U.S. You can go online and there's, there's a walking a line of a certain width through the forest and counting egg masses. But this is the one that was developed in Ontario. It's basically a 10 meter uh, square plot. Um, and within the plot, there are one square meter subplots. And uh, this is it laid out on the ground and using flagging tape with two observers. This person here is observing, is counting the egg masses within the one meter square plot. And this person is counting all the egg masses that are visible above ground. Uh, the slide on the right shows a typical gypsy moth egg mass that probably contains up to a thousand eggs. Smaller ones that are, you know, that are about the size of a dime, they contain uh, maybe a couple hundred eggs at most. Uh, the larger ones, the size of a toonie, then they can contain up to a thousand eggs. You count only the new eggs, as as David was talking about. Um, you count the number of eggs on those on the ground in those one meter square plots, and you multiply that by a thousand and you 
Take the number of eggs that you see above the ground with binoculars, multiply that by 100, and that gives you the total egg masses per hectare. And there's a nice little predictive formula here that says if you get more than 1,236 egg masses per hectare, you're going to get moderate defoliation. And if you get more than 6,000, you're going to get severe defoliation. Moderate defoliation is around 50% defoliation, which is what you can, what most observers would see. Most people don't see defoliation that's less than 50%. So um, that's a way that you can do this yourself. You can hire a contractor to do this to give you an estimate if you really want to know what the forecast is for your area. Municipalities do this, cottage associations do it, and, um, and the province has done it in the past. So moving into insect management program, what's it all about? Um, the slide on the right shows a BTK spray uh, on the left and one on the right where the trees were defoliated. Um, the, uh, you have to be clear on what your objective is. What is it you're trying to protect? Um, the slide on the right is a forest management one where this was protecting timber supply. Um, the, uh, the value, you have to be clear what the value is that you wish to protect. It could be aesthetics, could be recreational value, use of your property uh, over your pool, use, your, use of the land around a cottage, uh, <clears throat> maple syrup production, uh, wood supply, uh, habitat for wildlife, um, fire risk. You know, some of these areas, when they get uh, defoliated, they become uh, severe fire risk, the ground dries out, or human health. David mentioned that the caterpillars, the hairs of the caterpillars contain histamine. It makes an allergic reaction, and some people can become very allergic during insect, during gypsy moth outbreaks, to the point where, and some health authorities say, don't even hang your laundry outside if you're allergic because the hair is floating around in the air and the tiny caterpillars and so on, they, they can land on your clothing and then make you highly allergic. So some people do react strongly to it because the hairs contain histamine. What you're doing though is you're trying to control the defoliation, the level of impact, until those natural factors that I mentioned cause the population to collapse. Most of what we would do as humans doesn't really drive the population, it just keeps the trees alive and green until those natural factors cause population collapse. What are some of the tactics available to you? It depends on whether you're talking about individual trees, ornamentals, uh, yard trees, or if you're talking about woodlots, cottages, or the contiguous forest where you have much larger land base. You can do physical removal. You can use an insecticide. You can try to do ecological things, although your options aren't really great for trying to say, keep parasitism high or favor the virus or favor the fungus. There's not really much you can do there. Although for some other insect pests, that's possible. But for this one, there's not much you can do. Or you can take no action. What are your homeowner options? Um, depends on what you want to do and what how severe, severe it is. But one option is this burlap trap method, where you hang a uh, you put a cord around the tree and you hang a uh, a flap of burlap like a towel, and uh, requires you to go out every day and collect the caterpillars because during the hot part of the summer, what the caterpillars typically do is they leave the canopy and they crawl down to the trunk or lower and they shelter during the day and then they crawl up at night and and feed at night. So you get up in the morning, wonder what happened to your tree while well, the caterpillars were feeding all night. So one technique is to put this burlap band around the trunk of the tree and check it every day and collect the insects. Um, it feels good. It may not accomplish much because you know you have to get a lot of those in order to actually have an impact. But some people do this as a method of control and, uh, and, and as I said, it makes them feel good. Um, another thing you can do is a high pressure water spray and dislodge the caterpillars or a BTK spray and dislodge the cat and kill the caterpillars. Um, and then there's a slide on the right showing uh, somebody putting a sticky uh, band on the trunk of the tree. And what that does is stops them from crawling back up the tree. So if you've sprayed it to knock the tree insects out of the tree or you've treated it with uh, BTK or your, and you want it to prevent it from coming up from your neighbor's tree, you can put this sticky band on the trunk of the tree and stop it from coming up. You just want to make sure it doesn't get right on the trunk because it's, it's, uh, it'll kill the bark or dissolve it. Um, you can hire a licensed applicator. Uh, they can do early spring tree injections with uh, an insect, a systemic insecticide like Triazin or ASCAP, um, and they can do those injections for you. Um, you can also uh, spray the tree yourself or hire an applicator to use to, to treat the tree with, uh, with an insecticide. 
Uh, so you can buy this BTK, the bacterial product, at, at the hardware store or garden center, apply it yourself, or hire an applicator to do it for you. Um, and you can also do egg mass scraping and collecting eggs, trying to reduce the population. So this is a tree injection of, um, this is actually for a dashboard, but it's the same system uh, using treasin um, with the injector system. Uh, drill a hole in the trunk of the tree at the base, put the, uh, the uh, spile in, a spigot in, and, and then it, uh, there's a spring loaded uh, plate in there that pushes the insecticide into the tree, and then the tree translocates it up into the crown. And it is an effective means for gypsy moth control. Uh, egg mass scraping, this is a historical picture of back in the late 1800s where they were trying to control egg mass. I don't think the occupational health and safety people would let us do this today, um, but it is an um, entertaining historical slide. Um, so you can do egg mass scraping. Uh, you scrape the egg masses off. You should, this person's not wearing gloves, but you actually should wear gloves because if you're handling them at all, you're gonna get the, those, the, the brown on those egg masses is the hairs on the body of the female moth and she can't fly. So she just lays her eggs and um, covers them with the hair. And if you handle that, you're, you're eventually probably going to become allergic to it. So you should wear gloves. Scrape it, you scrape those egg masses could be laid anywhere, which makes it really hard to find. Um, and you put them into soapy water so that they essentially drown. Um, this is another historical photo, but you, you can, people are also, they climb the trees, they use uh, small handheld vacuums to, to, to pick up the insect or the eggs as they scrape them off. You don't want them to drop to the ground because you're just going to put them where the snow's going to protect them. Um, this makes you feel good. It may not accomplish a lot. It, it, it can help, but you know, if you think about the fact that one insect can lay a thousand eggs, and if you um, are able to scrape all, all the eggs that you can find, but you still, you only get 99% of, of the eggs that are out there. So if you start out with a thousand eggs in a mass, you've killed, you collected, you've killed 99% of those in some way or another. That still leaves, that still leaves 10 uh, gypsy moths surviving that year. And if 10, if five of those 10 are females and each one lays a thousand eggs, then all of a sudden you're back to 5,000 larvae the next year. So that, you really have to, something really has to knock down more than 99% of this insect population before next year's population would be lower than this year. So that's where those natural control factors like the disease, uh, the, the virus, the um, uh, fungus, and the pre uh, predators and parasites combined help to knock that population down. Uh, pheromone traps are mentioned sometimes. They are used only in Canada, approved only in Canada for detection and monitoring. They're not for um, they're not for population reduction, like I mentioned in the U.S., where they um, they use pheromones to knock down the population. So you can see the trap on the left that's opened up. You know that trap would quick, quickly get saturated in a high population, and you wouldn't collect enough of those males to stop them from finding females. And one male can mate with more than one female. So the pheromone traps are not that effective at trying to reduce the populations and are not approved for that use in Canada. Um, in order to use a pheromone for population control, it has to be registered with the Pest Management Regulatory Agency, and that hasn't happened in Canada. Um, in the US, when they use pheromones, it's these little flakes that are impregnated with the pheromone and they spray, spray them from an aircraft, and there's so many of them out there that the uh, the males just get confused and they can't find the females because there's pheromone everywhere. It's like being at a at a party where it's all full of of axe axe body spray and you can't and you can't all you, that's all you can smell. And the, um, uh, the so the the males uh, exhaust themselves trying to find females because the whole area is inundated with with um, um, with the pheromone. But that's not used in Canada. So I mentioned the, the insecticide BT spray as an option for management. This is a hardwood stand in Southern Ontario. You can see the sprayer on your left and, and the no sprayer in the right and in the background. A little bit about BTK. Um, again, the objective is to keep trees alive. It's not driving next year's population. It's much as keeping the trees alive and green until the natural controls can knock it back, knock the insect back down. BTK is a bacterial insecticide. It stands for Bacillus thuringiensis crustaki. 
um, Thuringiensis Thuringi is the name of the of the area in Germany where it was discovered, and Kerstaki is the subspecies where it was identified in Japan, showing that it kills caterpillars. Um, it's specific to the larvae, moss, and butterflies. It doesn't affect other insects. It doesn't affect um, beetles. It doesn't affect uh, mosquitoes or black flies. It doesn't affect bees or wasps or, 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 or their kin. Uh, it only affects the larvae of moths or butterflies that are out feeding at the time and get a lethal dose. It must be ingested to work. It must go into an alkaline digestive system. We have an acidic digestive system, so it doesn't affect us. Uh, and so the caterpillars and moths and, fly, and moths and butterflies have an alkaline digestive system, and it, that's the only way it works. Um, because of its safety, it is, there is no buffer zones required next to water or next to other properties. Um, and it's one of the few insecticides that's approved for organic farming. Uh, it's applied early in the spring to young caterpillars because it works best when the caterpillars are small and they don't, they can't fend it off as well. Um, it dies after three to five days from ultraviolet light. So after you spray, other caterpillars that might come along later are not going to be affected by it. Um, operations are typically done early in the morning under low wind conditions uh, during a temperature inversion so that the spray uh, drops down into the, into, the, uh, into the foliage and lands on the leaves for the caterpillars to come along and eat. Um, I usually get a question about non-targets. It will affect insects other than um, the target gypsy moth, the, the, but they have to be out there. Their life cycle has to match the, the, the caterpillars out there at the time of the spray and in the habitat where you're spraying. It's often a um, questions about monarch butterfly, which is in a different habitat. We, so we're not spraying monarch butterfly habitat. And usually the spraying for gypsy moth is done before the monarchs have arrived from the south and, and started to lay eggs and have the caterpillars out there. This is a spray with a product called 4A48B and it's usually a double application. So it spray, you'd spray it twice because um, you wanna get the early hatch eggs and, those, and the later hatching eggs. And here's a quick picture here of how this, in, this insecticide actually works. And the thing to look at is this, um, uh, this tetrahedral crystal on the top right. So that's what the bacteria releases when it's inside the insect stomach and it only dissolves in an alkaline stomach system and it perforates the stomach wall. It releases a toxin that perforates the stomach wall. So if this goes into an acidic digestive system, that protein crystal doesn't dissolve, it just passes through. Um, this is what you get from an operational spray. Lot, you can have GPS navigation systems that control exactly where they're going. You can get a printout of saying where it was done, when the booms were on. Uh, there's navigation systems here with a light bar telling the applicator where they are uh, with a map of all the areas that, uh, that are being treated or not treated, the booms on, booms off. The spray is about a liter and a half, like a bag of milk that's cut up into very fine droplets using this cage that spins in the wind on these fins and the spray comes out and it's, and it's spread over, um, uh, you know, a liter and a half over a hectare of forest. And you can spray by helicopter or fixed wing aircraft. A little bit about this virus product uh, that is specific to gypsy moth. So researchers in the US and in Canada developed this as an insecticide. In Canada, it's called Dispar virus. In the US, it's called Gypcheck. It's a powder of dried up caterpillars that are infected with the virus and it killed and then basically turned into a powder that is used to treat gypsy moth. It is um, specific to gypsy moth, doesn't affect other insects. Canadian Forest Service has licensed it to Silvar Technologies in New Brunswick. Um, it's, it's a niche product that is used in areas where you have a, a species at risk, uh, like an endangered species that might also be exposed if it, and affected if you're spraying an insecticide because the, the virus product only affects the gypsy moth. Um, it has to be applied in the early stages because it has to, uh, um, um, it has to spread and, and amplify in the caterpillars. Unfortunately for us, um, it's currently not available, but it may be available in 2021. We, we're, Silvar Technologies is trying to take this dry product and turn it into a liquid formulation and have it available but um, I'm not sure if it's going to be available or not, we will see. Um, it is more expensive to apply, it's trickier to apply, and it needs to be applied under the direction of the Canadian Forest Service. So if you're, doing, if you're looking to do this kind of work, then uh, you need to contact us 
uh, unless the new label comes out and says you don't need to, but the current label says it needs to be applied under that direction. It's a delayed action and must be amplified in the caterpillars in order to work. So you don't spray it today and, and go out in the afternoon and say, oh, why are the caterpillars still alive? It takes several days for it to work. Finally, uh, a couple more slides here, just to finish up with the economies of scale, what you're doing on our aerial spray. Uh, the more landowners you have together, the, the cheaper the cost is for the fixed cost, like getting the aircraft there. There's also logistics, the closer your woodlots are together, the longer your spray lines, the less discontinuous they are, the cheaper the cost. Uh, so groups can pool their resources and, and work together to hire an aerial applicator. And there's a fact sheet available on this. Um, to, now it's not too early to start if you're thinking of doing something. Uh, you can hire turnkey consultants that'll do this work for you and organize it all for you if you wish. Um, it's important to check references and past performance and make sure you've got a reputable operator to do what you want them to do. Uh, and this is all very highly regulated by the Ontario Ministry of Environment, Conservation and Parks under the Pesticides Act to make sure everything is done properly and safely. And the applicators are licensed that way and they, they do know what they're doing. Um, just re repeating the David slide here of showing that whatever you're doing, you need to match it to the life cycle, life, life stage of the insect's life cycle. Finally, take home messages. Um, <clears throat> this is a non-native insect, but it's behaving more or less now like a native species that has periodic outbreaks in Ontario. It can be difficult to predict next year's infestation. So if you're trying to decide whether or not what to do, it kind of it depends on your desires as a landowner. What, what are your objectives? What are your tolerances? What's your tolerance for risk? It's like an insurance policy in that um, we don't know for sure what's going to happen next year. Uh, some people will want to take action and say, I don't want to have that defoliation. I don't want to have that nuisance. Uh, planning a wedding, I can't have that outdoor problem. Or some people say, well, it's okay. I'll just deal with it and let nature take its course. It's up to the landowner decide how they want to deal with it. Um, there is an effective, safe product, BTK, it's available to use if you wish. And that's it for me, I'll hand it over to Lauren, thank you. Great, thank you, Taylor. Uh, we are almost at our time limit, um, but I'm gonna save some time for questions. We do have a lot of questions coming into the chat box. Um, so we do welcome you to reach out to the Invasive Species Center directly with your questions as well, as we will not get to every question uh, during this webinar. So if you are interested in sending emails directly, you can send them to info at invasivespeciescenter.ca. You can see the email on the screen there. But we do have time for a couple questions. So the first question that I'm going to uh, ask is, are there certain bird species that eat gypsy moths? Um, well, I guess I'll take that one. There are birds that do eat gypsy moth, but they're they do have they're not an easy insect to eat. There are some that eat them. They'll eat the the pupae in particular, but the um, the caterpillars are hard for them because of all the hairs. So there aren't really specialists that spend a lot of time just eating gypsy moth. They benefit from the gypsy moth population, but they don't drive the population. Okay, great. And uh, the next question is. I've noticed that new egg masses this year seem smaller than last year's. Is this a hopeful sign regarding next year's outbreaks? For example, that the adult females were under stress when laying their eggs. Do you want that one, David? Or do you want me to answer that? Uh, you might have to answer that one because uh, I, uh, personally, I haven't noticed that they were smaller this year, but uh, it could be due to different factors. So. So yeah, it's a. If you're seeing smaller egg masses, that's a good sign that the uh, the insect may be um, it may be starving. <laughs> as, it may very well be that it has um, it didn't get enough nutrition, or it may be that it has a. Uh, it's not as healthy. Insects get other diseases like um, they get fungal diseases or blood diseases that that spread in the population as well and weaken them so that um, they don't do as well, don't lay as many eggs. So if you're seeing smaller egg masses, that's good. But if you still have lots of egg masses that are small, then uh, then you could still have a very high population next year. Great. The next question is, are there any projections for future impacts of gypsy moth under climate change? If springs and, uh, and summers are getting warmer, 
what could limit the future outbreaks? Any insights into future scenarios? That's a that's a good question to which we can only speculate. But if if we know that the insect does better in hot, dry weather, and if we get more of those kinds of uh, uh, summers, then the insect will do much better. Um, as well, if it's not as cool and wet, then the the fungus won't do as well. So under a warming climate, then you can certainly get uh, increased survival of the insect, faster growth of the insect, and um, and stress on the trees because the trees could easily be stressed by their growing conditions and uh, that then means the insect could do better as well. So climate change in principle is going to favor some insects like gypsy moth that are uh, do depend on, on warmer temperatures to grow faster and to outstrip or outgrow the, uh, the growth of the trees. So that yeah, climate change could certainly make this um, more of a problem. I don't know that you'll see it changing its distribution. It's already distributed where the oak is except for Northwestern Ontario. It can feed well on uh, aspen and birch in the far north. Um, it hasn't moved into that area yet. That could be weather that uh, is keeping it from going into outbreak in that area, or it could just be that it really does like to have oak before it goes into outbreaks. So even though aspen and birch in the north would be a suitable host, it may really need the oak more than the warm temperatures, but we don't know that for sure. And Taylor, like you mentioned before, uh, with warmer winters comes more snow usually. So the higher the snow, the more uh, gypsy moth eggs that are under those snow and can handle uh, colder temperatures. Yeah, that's a good point, David. And, and I'll add to that then um, that with climate change, it's not just warm weather that we are expecting. We're also expecting more extremes in weather. So you get the extreme heat, but you can also get extreme cold. So the polar vortex winters that we had, if you link that to climate change, that can be uh, very devastating on the gypsy moth population and kill off large numbers of them because it's really, really cold. So the extreme weather could, in some cases, could affect the, the gypsy moth population in a negative way. Okay, great. And this next question, if you're to beat and scrape the egg masses off of the tree and they fall onto the ground, are they considered dead? No, they're not considered dead. They actually will uh do fine because like we said before if they're under that uh snow layer they can actually just uh crawl out of those uh, areas and they're protected over the winter time so you'd have to actually physically remove the egg masses and put them into like taylor said a, a soapy water solution or something like that in order to actually kill the eggs okay great Last, uh, the last question that we're going to ask today, just being conscious of time, why are gypsy moth larvae targeting white pine in Lanark County? Because they can, <laughs> because they like white pine. Um, they do like white pine and they do like oak, so it's one of their hosts. Um, I don't know that they're targeting it as much as they're feeding on because it's one of their, their, their preferred hosts. Okay, great. With that, I would just like to thank the speakers um, and also send out a reminder to check out our website at invasivespeciescenter.ca where you can find a lot of our resources, including our gypsy moth species profile. This is where we upload existing and new resources, so be sure to check back on our uh, gypsy moth species page and our website for some of our other resources that are available. I'd like to thank our speakers, Taylor and David, again, for a really great presentation and to thank all of our listeners for attending. A reminder that if your question was not answered, please just reach out to the Invasive Species Center. Either we will contact you through our question box or you can email us directly today at info at Thanks again to everyone for attending and enjoy the rest of your day.